and reggae star Bob Marley, Rita Marley, and the manager of the whalers, Don Taylor, are now patients in the university hospital after receiving gunshot wounds during a shooting incident which took place at Marley's home at 56 Road tonight. So when the gunshots started firing on Hope Road, the first thing come back to my mind was the vision. And all I could remember is that the vision said, don't run. And that Where were you hit? Eh? Where were you hit? Me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Went right through? Or just skin? No, I said lodge inside there. Yeah? Yeah. You never saw the gunman? Well, at that time, no. But you know who did it? Yeah, I know them. Were they caught? No, but I don't caught the police. Mm. It's just, you know, what I'm saying. Hello, everybody. You're welcome back again to the Reggae Appreciation Society. On the 3rd of December in 1976, Jamaica, the entire global reggae community, and indeed the world, was stunned by the shocking news that Bob Marley, reggae's global ambassador, the musical maestro with a world mandate to spread the message of love, and the feel-good Rasta icon that made the world dance, had barely escaped an attempt on his life by a seven-man team of hitmen that stormed his home with the aim of taking him out. That incident marked a new low in the darkness and chaos which had erupted from the political war between the PNP and JLP political parties, which had basically overrun Jamaica in those times. The violence had proliferated along partisan lines and was terrible enough, but Bob Marley had transcended partisanship, stayed neutral and even tried to use his influence to quell the violence, as he was almost worshipped by both PNP and JLP street generals like Bucky Marshall and Claudie Massop. The matter left Bob badly disappointed and pained that his own people had tried to take his life, and it would spur him to go into self-imposed exile for almost two years. Though the attack was easily found to be politically motivated, the Jamaican authorities never unraveled the identities of the men that stormed Bob's house that night. But Bob Marley's manager, Don Taylor, has since then provided mind-blowing information that detailed how the assailants were not only rooted out by the streets, but also received swift and brutal retribution in the back alleys of the ghettos where Bob Marley was idolized as a king. Let's take a look at the story of what happened to the men that shot Bob Marley. To really get to the bottom of this matter, we need to start from the political violence which erupted in Jamaica between gunmen of the ruling PNP political party and the opposition JLP party, led respectively by then Prime Minister Michael Manley and opposition leader Edward Siaga. By 1976, Kingston was deeply divided, with different areas claimed as turf by respected party strongmen. Bob, being a product of the ghettos himself, was moved to use his influence to unite his country. So in November of that year, he came up with the idea of staging a free Christmas concert that would lift the spirits of the embattled Jamaican people. To stage an event on that scale, approval had to be obtained from the authorities, and he used his clout to get the go-ahead from Prime Minister Michael Manley. The show was to be called the Smile Jamaica Concerts and scheduled to hold on the 5th of December 1976. Despite Bob's best intentions and political neutrality, Prime Minister Michael Manley, like your average politician, postured in a way that sent a signal that the concert was his idea and some kind of endorsement from Bob Marley. To make matters worse, Michael Manley suddenly announced the date of the next general elections. The JLP party and its supporters saw the concert as a slap in the face and through its enforcers, sent several messages to Bob to discourage him from going ahead with the show. But the Top Gong's mind was already made up. So on Friday evening, on the 3rd of December, just two days to the show, Bob was rehearsing with his band at his home on number 56 Hope Road, when at least seven men, heavily armed with machine guns, stormed the place and opened fire with an obscene amount of ammunition, injuring Bob, Rita Marley, and his manager, Don Taylor, who all barely escaped with their lives in miraculous circumstances. Despite his injuries, Bob was still undeterred and played the show two days later before proceeding on self-imposed exile to England for almost two years, before returning in April 1978, just in time for the now legendary One Love Peace concert, a grand event to promote peace on the island. Bob's performance at the concert was immortalized when he famously joined the hands of Michael Manley and Edward Siaga in an iconic gesture of reconciliation. 
The return of Bob Marley to Jamaica was celebrated by not only the masses but also of the Jamaican underworld. The king was back and the various Don Gorgons were eager to give him the ultimate welcome back present. The Jamaican police had failed to catch the men who had almost snuffed out the life of the island's favorite son but the streets had already solved the mystery. According to Don Taylor, he got a call one day from one of the right-hand men of JLP Don, Claudie Massop, that the men who attacked Bob Marley's home were in their custody and invited he and Bob to come over immediately to witness prosecution and judgment in the ghetto's own version of the courts. The men in question were allegedly JLP sympathizers but had operated totally outside the knowledge and authority of Claudie Massop's group. Bob and Don Taylor were led to a lonely spot near the tough neighborhood of the McGregor Gully in East Kingston by one of Claudie Massop's men to where the trial was taking place. The ghetto court was in session and seated were all the local Kingston crime bosses with three young men all tightly tied up and bound in the gully. One by one, each man was questioned and each one confessed to taking part in the attempt on Bob's life. The dogs listened to every plea and story from the men who begged and wept for mercy and even apologized and appealed to Bob and his manager for forgiveness. Bob had forgiven the men but it didn't matter to these ghetto judges. Justice would be served for their offenses, street style. They were all sentenced to death with two to die by hanging and one to be shot. Between 5 and 6 p.m. that Wednesday evening, the first two men were taken away and hung. The ghetto judges offered Bob the opportunity to carry out judgment on the third one who was supposed to be shot. Bob refused and again tried to put in a word for the young man but he was ignored. The young man was taken away and shot. The ghettos had executed judgment on the men who had almost taken the life of their hero and Jamaica's greatest icon. According to Taylor, the Dons made it clear that Bob was one of theirs and that inviting him over was the way of letting him know that they had absolutely no hand in the attempt on his life. And with the proceedings over, Bob and his manager got in their car and sat for a while totally stunned at what they had just witnessed. They drove back to Bob's Hope Road house in total silence and would never speak about what they had just seen on that day to anyone, not even to each other, even up until the tough gong passed away three years later. Don Taylor only broke his silence and revealed the events of that grisly judgment day. When he put these details in his book, titled Marley and Me, The Real Bob Marley, which was published in 1994. This story is further testament to the kind of spirit that Bob had. He totally forgave the men who had almost killed him, his wife and his manager and even did what he could to save their lives. An amazing display which proved yet again that the tough gong not only preached the gospel of one love but also practiced it up until the very end. So there you have it. Thank you for watching the video today. Please leave a like, subscribe and until next time, jobless.